Okay, welcome back to part three. I hope you are all enjoying this story. Uh, I believe I left you off with we were going to go see Judge Kelly. Um, so we, Jerry came over the next morning, and bright, bright and early, and uh, we went to go see the judge. We wanted to be the first person there to see that judge. And uh, when we got there, Charles Garland was just leaving. So apparently Charles Garland Super Trooper got there even earlier than us. We didn't know what he had to say to the judge. It didn't matter to us because we were going to tell the judge our side of it all. And uh, so we actually got in to see the judge, and the judge told us. He said, yeah, Charles Garland just left, Officer Garland, and um, why don't you tell me what's going on? And uh, we told him. We said, look, you know, we, I said, look, I'm, I need to get my timber logged. I said, I sold my timber to this man here. Um, I said he paid me a lot of money for it, and I said this cop, this Officer Garland, is is really preventing uh, preventing us from from getting the timber. And the judge, Judge Kelly, was just a really he was an honest man. Uh, judge Kelly did not get reelected, by the way, and I and I really truly believe it was because he did the right thing um, and went against the drug dealers. I really think that that's the case. Um, in a lot of ways, I feel I really feel like I owe that man because. If not for him, everything would have been completely screwed. But anyway, Judge Kelly says, look, I will meet you guys tomorrow at your place. I told him where he lived. And he goes, I'll take a look at the situation. I'll bring the, the uh, county road foreman with me, and we'll take a look at the whole deal. And, and, um, and I, at that time, I didn't know how honest he was, so I was still a little leery, but I'm hoping for the best. Uh, he said, well, we'll take a look at the situation. So he comes to my house. It was the next afternoon. Um, and, uh, which is, you know, I mean, you can't ask for more than a judge actually coming out and taking a look. And he looked at the situation, and the road foreman, the county road foreman, I can't think of the guy's name anymore, but he said, there's no reason you cannot bring your logs out. Um, he had asked Jerry what size truck they were, they were planning on uh, uh, hauling the logs with, and Jerry told him, and he said, there's no reason you can't use this road. And the judge said, you know, I'll tell you what, he goes, and the judge was looking at the situation, he goes, why don't we do this? He said, can you guys go from where you plan on using, you know, where, where you plan on doing your, your landing, can you cut a road parallel to the paved road and come out to the, at the railroad tracks? If you come out at the railroad tracks, I, the county will guarantee the road from the railroad tracks to the highway, which was, you know, which was a pretty good deal for us, actually, uh, in one sense. <laughs> the other sense, it was a bad deal because it wasn't going to be cheap. The bodos, the, the road, no big deal, but it was dirt, so you had to gravel the hell out of it. Ended up costing sixteen thousand dollars in gravel to to uh, to do that. But uh, we said to Judge Kelly, we said, well, if that if if if, if that's okay with you, that's okay with us. If you tell us that we can work, we're just going to go ahead and do that, done. And the judge says, you can go ahead and do that. Well, well, we start working on the road. It took three days to cut that road in with no gravels on it. And we did exactly what we said we were going to do. We cut that road all the way up to the railroad tracks. We were going to come out at the railroad tracks and over to the railroad tracks. So we cut that road in and then started, we, we, we started bringing the gravels in. And I think we got three gravel trucks on that road before Charles Garland figured out what was going on. <laughs> so Charles Garland, he gets up and then gets in his patrol car, and the, the next loads were coming, and as they were turning off the highway, there he sat, and he stopped them. All three trucks, stopped all three trucks, and had all three of these truck drivers sitting on a guardrail on the side of the highway. I, I'm down there watching this, you know, just from a distance, so I'm watching this. And uh, then I seen the guys get back in their trucks with their tickets that Garland had given them, and they turned around and they left without bringing us the gravel. So we're like, son of a bitch, you know, what do you do? And um, he was writing these guys tickets for, for something they hadn't even done yet. You know, it was just absolutely amazing. But he was, you know, I mean, what do you do? He's a rogue, rogue cop. So we went back to the judge and the judge says, you know, I told him that you guys had permission to, to do what you were doing. And apparently he doesn't care. And Charles Garland's attitude was, I don't care this county judge, it's nothing to me, I'm a state police officer. And uh, it was just an absolute mess. Well, I remember 
that day, as he was writing those tickets, I noticed on the side of his, his he was vehicle enforcement. I think that's what they call themselves. But uh, on the side of his patrol car was an 800 number. And I wrote it down. And uh, I called the number. And I asked for somebody in uh, internal affairs. And I think it was, uh, the, well, the first person that was a woman that answered the phone. And I said, I need to speak to somebody in internal affairs. And she said, well, what's this about? I said, well, I have a state police officer protecting a drug house at the end of my holler. And he's preventing me from lawfully getting my, my timber off, off my property. And she said, well, hold on. And then a sergeant picked up the phone. I told him the exact same thing. He put me on hold. And then a captain picked up the phone. He put me on hold, and then a guy named Major Frazier from the Kentucky State Police, Major Frazier, um, I told him the story, he just couldn't believe it. <laughs> yeah, this is Frankfurt, you know, I've talked to the guys in Frankfurt, because Frankfurt's the capital, state capital of Kentucky. And uh, he's, he's like, you're just kidding. He goes, I'm embarrassed. I said, well, you know, it is what it is. I said, I'm embarrassed for you. And he goes, well, let me look into this. And I said, all right. <laughs> well, later that day, I'm up in the mountain on my four-wheeler, and um, I ran across a couple of guys. And they're on four-wheelers. They're on my property, and they're on four-wheelers, which made me a little nervous. Uh, and I stopped, and I sat up, and I had a, a windbreaker on. And my hands in my pocket, well, what they didn't know was in my right pocket was my Glock 40 tail. And I did not know these guys, and they, 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 they looked a little squirrely. And uh, we're sitting there, it was a really kind of an awkward moment. I said, how y'all doing? They said, oh, we're doing all right, how you doing? I said, all right. They said, you're, you're that hunter boy, aren't you? I said, yeah. I said, you have a little bit of problem with Frito, aren't you? I said, yeah. And the one guy goes, you know... That old cop, he's just Frito's lap dog, he, and he's just earning his keep. And I said, I'm sure, I'm sure. And they said, well, you know, you best be careful, because word has it that Frito's going to burn your house down in the middle of the night and shoot you as you run out of it. I said, good to know. Appreciate the, appreciate the heads up. And I didn't know if it was really a heads up or if it was just a flat out threat from them. I mean, I didn't know the guys. Never seen them before in my life. For all I knew, they were Frito's guys. Later on down the road, I found out that they weren't Frito's guys. They were actually other dope growers. They they weren't big fans of Frito's because they were more or less Frito's competition in in some ways. So, I, I mean, at least I mean, I I, I kind of knew that that's the direction things were going in. So things got a little a little worrisome for me at the time because, you know. Now I kind of felt like I was really in a bind. I mean, I, I, I may have bit off more than I could chew in some sense, but I, I felt so committed I couldn't turn around. And I said to, um, I said to this guy, the, the first guy, I said, listen, I said, why won't Charles Garland just back off? I said, we, get, we had a judge say we could, you know. And the guy said, you've got to understand, Frito's got his gardens in. He can't have you cutting trees down now. I said, how much could he, how much is planted on my property? And the one guy said, well, about $500,000 worth. And I'm like, oh my God. So now I get kind of, the, it had nothing to do with the fence. It had everything to do with the fact that Frito had a half a million dollars of pot planted on my property. <laughs> and, you know, big old oak trees falling down on top of his, his, uh, his crops wasn't exactly in his best interest. So now I felt really screwed because I knew there was a very good chance that they, that, that they would kill me before, before they lost on that deal. So anyway, um, I'm losing track of time. So I'm going to stop it here. If it's a short one, it's a short one. Um, and then I'll come back for part four.